and hell awaits. And hell awaits our children because we can't help but mislead our children. Okay, now just hold this vision in mind. And, and first appreciate how little sleep you have lost over this possibility. Okay, just feel in yourself at this moment how carefree you are and will continue to be in the face of this possibility. What are the chances that we're all going to go to hell for, for eternity because we haven't recognized the Quran to be the perfect word of the creator of the universe? Please know that this is exactly how Christianity appears to someone who's not been indoctrinated by it. Our scriptures were written by people who by, 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 by virtue of their placement in history had less access to scientific information and facts and basic common sense than any person in this room. Okay. It, in fact, there's not a person in this room who's ever met a person whose worldview was as narrow as the worldview of Abraham or Moses or Jesus or Muhammad. And mo most of these people, with a few exceptions, had, had a moral worldview that was more or less indistinguishable from that of an Afghan warlord today. Okay, and yet Dr. Craig insists that the authors of the Bible knew everything they had to know about the nature of the cosmos and about how to live within it to guide us at this moment. Okay, I want to suggest to you that this vision of life can't possibly be true. Okay, but just as there's no such thing as Christian physics or Muslim algebra, there can be no such thing as Christian or Muslim morality. Whatever is true about our circumstance in moral terms and in spiritual terms is discoverable now and can be talked about in, in language that is not an outright affront to everything that we've learned in the last 2,000 years. Okay, what remains for us to discover are the facts in every domain of knowledge that will allow the greatest number of us to live lives truly worth living in this world. I mean, how is it that we can build a global civilization, a viable global civilization of now destined to be 9 billion people with a maximum number of people truly flourish. That is the challenge we face. Sectarian moral denominations, okay, a world shattered, balkanized by competing claims about an invisible God is not the way to do it, apart from the fact that there's no evidence in the first place that should be compelling to us to adopt that view. The only tool we need is honest inquiry. And I would suggest to you that if faith is ever right about anything in this domain, it's right by accident. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to all of you. We started 15 minutes late, and so I'm going to allow us to go until 9.15. That gives us 30 minutes for questions. As I said at the beginning, we're going to allow Notre Dame students to ask the first four questions. After that, the microphones are open to anyone. We'd like to keep a brisk pace for the questions, so please limit your questions to about 30 seconds, and I've, I've asked the debaters to limit their responses to about two minutes. I'll take the liberty of urging people to get quickly to their point if these time limits are violated. Uh, we have microphones here and here. I think we have microphones. Oh, good. I can see the microphones yeah. in the balcony, so I'll just go in a circuit. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Harris, if Dr. Craig could link out of your objections about the problem of evil and the problem of choosing the right religion um, so that those weren't really problems, th those weren't functioning in the debate, where does that put you dialectically? Well, how, how do those function in the debate? Do you mean if I was given good reason to believe that Christianity is true? So um, or if and, Dr. And, and Craig could show that um, choosing a particular religion wasn't necessary for the grounding of, uh, of um, morality, just that some religion being true was sufficient for there being a grounding for morality. 
and that the problem of evil was somehow answered? Well, I, I would never be tempted to dispute that we could make up a religion that, if true, would be a grounding of morality. I mean, you could, those, are, those imaginary schemes are, are there for the asking. We could make them up. Uh, and, we could, and, and, and in about five minutes, we could make up a better religion than any that exists. I mean, you just, you just take Christianity and cut out Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and already you've done great work. Um, so, and, you know, we could, write, we could rewrite the Ten Commandments in less than five minutes and improve upon it. Um, so, you know, being kind to, add being kind to children and swap out the bit about the graven images, and you've already made it a, a much wiser document. Now, um, so, but that, that's not the point. I mean, the, the, the point is that one point I made, which, which he, he never really addressed, is that the, the, you're, you're smuggling in a concern for well-being in any case. You just have a different timeline. If Christianity were true, it would be part of my moral landscape. I mean, if, if someone like myself is going to suffer in hell for eternity based on what I'm currently thinking, then I clearly am... am doing the wrong thing. I mean, I would, I, would want, I would want that information, and I would think, uh, I mean, that, that would be a revelation to me, which I would take seriously, and I would do everything I could to get into heaven. I mean, that would be, heaven is, a, if, if eternity in heaven versus eternity in hell is really the, 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 the landscape that we're living on, well, that's part of my moral landscape. It just changes its, its, its temporal characteristics. There's just no reason to think that that's the universe we're living in. Up and to my left. Hi. Uh, Professor Craig, uh, you made an interesting analogy. You said uh, that long before we could uh, explain scientifically where light came from, we could distinguish between uh, light and dark, and that the same could be said for good and evil. But to me, that analogy seems dangerous because long before we could explain scientifically where light came from. We said it came from God. Could the same be said for morality? And then also, how do you explain shifts in moral consensus over time? Okay, I'm not sure I understood all of the questions, so I might need our moderator to help me here. The, I, the last part of the question was shifts in morality over time. Don't confuse moral ontology with moral epistemology. Moral ontology is the foundation in reality for objective moral values and duties. Moral epistemology is how we come to know the goods that there are and the duties that we have. And clearly, affirming that there are objective moral values and duties doesn't mean that we always know them infallibly. Uh, clearly, over time, there is such a thing as moral growth and moral development. When I look at my own life, I. I look back at my life as a young man and I can see certain attitudes and things that I had that I now would be ashamed of morally. I think I've experienced moral growth. So uh, there's, there's no reason to think that the objectivity of moral values and, and duties implies that there isn't such a thing as moral growth or a clearer apprehension of the good, or sadly in some cases, a moral degeneration of a society and turning away from good. So, these are two different problems, and, and my concern is moral uh, ontology. Now, I didn't catch the first part of the question. Mike, did you? Uh... Uh, yeah, tell me if I misrepresent you, but I take it that she's asking. You, you say that we understood light and dark oh. before we understood the physics of light. Um, she says, but we posited supernatural explanations for light also oh. at that time. Why not think morality is in the same situation? Yeah, again, the, I think you misunderstood the analogy there that I'm making. What I'm saying there is distinguishing moral ontology from moral semantics. And I, what I'm saying is I'm not offering a moral semantical theory about the meaning of the words good and evil, right and wrong. I'm talking about their foundation in reality. And so the example of light was simply to give an example of where people understood the meaning of the English word light, even if they didn't know its physical nature uh, in terms of electromagnetic radiation. Can I clarify? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I get that you're arguing that there needs to be a source for 
good and evil. That makes sense. But why does that source have to be God? Could it not be that we just haven't discovered what the source is? Before? Well, that would be my second contention, that in the absence of God, I can't see any foundation that would be left for affirming the objectivity of moral values, and particularly the value of human beings and conscious life on this planet. And then that second problem about objective moral duties is especially serious, the is-ought distinction, and then the ought implies can problem, no free will. So that, that would just be to reiterate the arguments I've already given as to why I think in the absence of God, uh, there wouldn't be objective moral values and duties. I allowed the follow-up only because there was misunderstanding, just so you know. <laughs> Up and to my right. Yeah, uh, I've got a question for Dr. Harris. Um, so a lot of the argument, I guess, I, I, I felt like it depended a lot on the definition of good, and, of good and bad, right and wrong. And I wanted to ask you if you thought it would, it would be possible for there to be, um, so I've got a two-part question, for there to be a hypothetical God that, um, so t scratch everything you know about Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, create your own new God, and if it would be hypothetical for this God to perfectly align with your definition of moral, th of, of moral theory. So say that this God says and, and commands that good and bad are dependent on the well-being of, of conscious animals. And then uh, simultaneously to that question, whether you think a God of love does just that. Because it, it seems to me, in, in my experience and in, in looking at history, that there is uh, no greater continuum across human history than the presence of love and the fact that we've had marriage, whether homosexual, heterosexual, transgender, from the moment we've been, we've been living animals. And so if that really is the root of our well-being, then how does, it, how does a God of love not promote well-being? So, but answer yeah. the first part. First. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, love clearly has a lot to do with, with our well-being. Uh, and if there were a God of love uh, who was really acting like a God of love uh, and was making, um, I mean, I, the, the problem is the, the existence of God doesn't really add to the moral stature of love in that case because, uh, or, or the moral stature of the good. I mean, we, we, this is to, goes to the Euthyphro dilemma that we haven't spoken about pr probably mercifully. Uh, but, I mean, if, if, if it's either intrinsically good or it isn't, and for God to say it's good uh, doesn't make it more good, uh, and it's not, it's not good by fiat. So he's either saying it's good because it is good, in which case we can just deal with the fact that it is good, or it's just good because he says it's good, but then he can say any evil thing is good, which Dr. Craig's God does rather often, uh, apparently. So, um, but love is clearly uh, something we, we desperately want in our lives, and we're right to want it. We're deeply social creatures. Uh, and the fear that is sort of circulating here, that's, that, that well-being somehow leaves something out that's important, I think, and I argue at some length in my book, is, is quite unfounded because whatever you bring to me which, which is truly important, you say, okay, you're talking about well-being, but here I'm talking about self-transcending love. This is really important. Well, self-transcending love is, a, is a, uh, uh, probably at the core of, of, of the deepest well-being that we can experience as human beings. And, but likewise, if the Christian hell exists and awaits me, uh, well-being in the, in the end is predicated on avoiding those flames. And so, that, and so all of that, you're, you're, still, you're smuggling, smuggling in a concern about consciousness and its future changes, whatever you bring uh, in the moral domain. And, and so I'm, I'm saying we, we must be honest about that. We ground this in consciousness. And then we can talk about how, how human beings like ourselves can, can thrive. And, and I, would, I would grant you that love is, is, is probably on, on the the top of the list. Uh, down here to my right. Um, Mr. Harris, um, uh, from my personal experience and uh, from my faith, I find that um, Christ's first uh, commandment was to love thy neighbor and you know, thy God. And I believe that uh, if you are a Muslim, then you follow through with that. If you are a devout Muslim and you care about the well-being of all mankind. And um, it's kind of in relation to my next question, which is like, how would a naturalist respond to amazing miracles by God, which like say the miracle of the sun, which was witnessed by 30,000 to 100,000 people in Fatima, Portugal in 1917, as well as miracles of the Eucharist in which the Eucharist actually starts to form veins and bleed. 
and where this blood is actually tested and is found to be AB positive, 